Anyway, so Peggy Goo, right? The, the girls on everyone's lips and the girl that I'm sure a lot of dudes would like to have on their lips, which is why they probably hate on her, but she'll probably tell you to get the fuck out of here. So she gave a really good interview at the Evening Standard. Um, uh, I think it was in ES Magazine, which should be all around London right now. So she's going to be even more famous than she's already. So for all you haters out there, it's probably going to be super annoying to see her plastered all over the uh, train lines and shit. But she gave a really good interview, and I think the interview is really good because, in general, I haven't thought about it, haven't read, read over it, and kind of meditated over something she said. She doesn't really talk as much as you'd think she talks, right? Like, considering how she, how forward she is on social media, she's always posting stuff, she's very, very interactive with her fans, all that malarkey. Um, she keeps herself to herself in terms of interviews. She doesn't really respond to some of the criticism that might exist out there in the interwebs most of the time because, you know, there's nothing really you can say when people just don't like you. Um, I don't think there's any way to explain it, I don't think there's any way to really convince them to to like you or to give you a chance i think the only thing you can do is just to kind of show and prove with your actual work and i think the fact that she gets booked at so many reputable um top tier um elite of the elite um djs d your favorite djs d your favorite djs favorite venue place i think it kind of shuts up all the arguments but there's some points in it that i kind of want to speak about that i think are very very interesting uh so i made some notes about it but let's just read through the article and we can kind of speak about it in jest so this is a, a article on evening standard it's called dj peggy goo on the best way to deal with sexism kill them with kindness um peggy goo played almost 200 shows last year and has been described as the mo most beloved dj on earth which isn't probably true i don't think she's beloved i think she's beloved no she's beloved with fans i think and she if you look at her comments you look at some of the comments online people really love peggy goo but i think within dj circles within the industry i don't think there's a lot of goodwill with her in general i think maybe it's not really to do with her. I think it's to do with the current climate in DJ land, right? Because, you know, like I mentioned before, I think there was a massive push with some female DJs out there that there wasn't enough um, female representation in most of the lineups, right? This is why some festivals, I forgot which one it was. I think it might have been Phil there. One of those festivals decided to have a 50-50 lineup, right? Which didn't really make any sense because you don't really want to, um, you don't really want to install those kind of rules on lineups because by and large, you know, there's no way to account for and how do you say this it's it's pretty obvious that there's going to be as many good female djs going to be male djs right i don't know why that is it there's i can't really explain the reason why but there is there is there are more male djs out there so there'll probably be more better ones to choose from in that pool so to say 50 50 is hard because you're essentially choosing from a smaller pool of people and with a women's dj so you're essentially putting people on the stage that probably have no right being there in terms of skill wise now again a, a really good dj a re, um, i guess a, a female DJ could kind of shoot back at me and say by agostino that's essentially what they do with the guys right you're, you're telling me all the guys that play on these festival stages are good djs no of course not and good or bad is subjective but i think what should be happening is what most pros are doing it's just a bit of common sense um uh lineup planning right it's like when what was that it's like when someone's doing a latin american um infused dj night right maybe it might be a good idea to book some djs who are latino american right who are, who are latino who are from south america but some of these dickhead promoters don't do that and they'll pick up a bevy of entirely white djs who all happen to be dudes then social media gets an uproar and then the promoters are all surprised. Like, why are you surprised? Like, just use, your, use some common sense. So a better common sense DJing, common sense booking will be a good one, right? Like, for instance, like, this is a really cheesy example, but I've always wondered, right, why there aren't a more uh, promoters out there putting on very heavy um leaning female friendly Valentine's Day shindigs, right? Whether or not they're queer leaning or mostly uh, straight, why aren't there more parties out there that are heavily promoted to women that are Valentine's Day parties? Because I'm sure there's loads of girls out there that would love to go to a night right out especially in shoreditch where they play loads of great old school hip-hop and r&b especially the 90s r&b like you know like super amazing 112 stuff that they could just sing to high you know sing uh, you know in high voices and screech and stand on tables and drink rosé and prosecco and shit and just don't give a shit about dudes dudes can come if they want but it's not a place to hook up it's just a place for girls to go and dress sexy and just you know listen to r&b why aren't there more of these things don't know why it happens most of the times it, uh, valentine's day happens and it's just you know your standard dude playing in a new era hat so for me personally i never liked it i never liked the idea that you know most of the time i go to the nightclubs and i go out and have a good time i look around the dance floor and the dance floor is essentially mixed but then when you look up at the dj booth it's always the same sort of person playing behind the decks right um in the dance floor there's loads of different kinds of creeds loads of um genders i mean i'm sorry um there's loads of girls there as well and all of a sudden you look at the dj booth and it's the same kind of dude playing it all the time so i never got that in that respect but i think peggy probably represents the antithesis of that right she's essentially been thrust into this position 
prim- no, not primarily because she's a very good DJ, primarily because she makes really good tracks, and also because she's hot, and also because she happens to be a girl, and also because of her background and all that. So, like they've all played a role into where she's kind of got. And I think she, and I think for some people, she represents the kind of you know what they hate about the industry, about how what it's become, right? The idea fifty fifty women, the idea that you know you get someone in that you know happens to be I don't know uh gender gender neutral blah 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 this background i don't know i I get why people can have those feelings but i think after reading this interview you can only have respect for it so let's go on with the interview so the interview starts um you can tell a lot about a person by the attitude to lifts um let me do this again what's the what's the lifts um so um impatient peggy goo so impatient is peggy goo that she blows my intoler blows my own intolerance out of the water people keep getting in she must stabbing at the buttons on lift in the net come on um once we are safely inside her plush suite she's uh, in town from berlin it becomes immediately apparent that her impatience is born out of a rude is not born out of rudeness but out of a mile a minute has lust of for life and a desire to get on with things frankly it's a miracle she managed to sit relatively still long enough to be interviewed south korean goo 28 ooh, jesus she's done a lot in it only 28 well done girl there's typical multi hyphenate a dj musician producer fashion designer illustrator who played nearly 200 shows last year alone DJ into crowds to devoted fans from Australia to, to Asia, not forgetting Belfast, one of the best cities to DJ, and of course Berlin, which usually is her home, or at least as home as anywhere can be when you spend most of your life on a plane. Sometimes I wake up in my hotel like, where am I? <laughs> and then you would, would you like a juice? I'm going to order a juice. She calls for room service. Any juice, she says, maybe something zingy. As she needs it, as if she needs it. She's in a good mood tonight, having just played her new EP, Moment to Floating Points, one of her favourite producers. The two-track EP sees her singing in the Korean again uh, more ambitiously than she did once uh, on once her previous EP that released last year. So, you know, you get a good idea of who she is. Um, she's very impatient. She likes to drink green juices. What is the DJs drinking green juices? I'm surprised not... Uh, I know we've got Richie Horton um, does his um, sake. I'm surprised no one's done... Um, a DJ line of green juices that they kind of, that'd be awesome, right? Yeah. Imagine they could do a, a line of green juices that they could somehow get to you. Hmm. Yeah. Imagine there was a line of green juices that you could have stocked in certain hotels around the world that most DJs stay in when they come into town. It'll probably be hard to get a list of those hotels, but it'd be quite cool to do that, right? Get a, a list of hotels that most DJs play in, uh, stay in, sorry, when they're in town, and then produce a particular kind of um, green juice or smoothie or general that, you know, one that, you know, a perfect hangover cure, something to give you energy, something to keep you calm, whatever it may be called. Those kind of juices have to be stuck. That'd be fucking awesome idea, and I might have to, I might have to fucking write that down in my notes, actually. Um, Again, I write so many stuff in my notes that I probably won't end up doing, but let's just write it down anyway. Green uh, juice for DJs stocked. Uh, let's see here. For DJs stocked in hotels around the world uh, where they play. Yeah. Boom. Okay. There we go. We got, see, that's the benefit of reading interviews with people that are really successful. That it makes you get you inspired. If you read interviews like this and, and you just start hating, there's something wrong in your brain. Your brain's wired a bit weird. Anyway, uh, Goo calls her sound K House. Although it's hard for me to rationalize my music sometimes, um, that her sound is hard to, to categorize as part of the appeal. Her influence um, include Acid House, Old School, Chicago House, Detroit Techno, with the odd African beat thrown in. Her DJ sets are just as eclectic. It has to. It has to have a journey. If you're playing at a really long set. My longest has been six hours. It's difficult because you can't just play big tunes. Three hours is a good enough length for me. She wasn't drawn to K-pop growing up though. A lot of people ask me that, but no. Just because I'm singing in Korean doesn't mean... I don't want to sound rude, but I don't listen to much of it because the lyrics aren't so catchy. Cool. Um, is that cultural appropriation? I don't know. It can't be because she's from Korea, right? Um, but I know some fucking work motherfuckers on Twitter will get all up in arms about it. Um, Gu likes to speak in short, uh, staccato sentences. This, this whoever's interviewing her fucking is in love with Gu, isn't it? And while her English is perfect, the accent is freakishly French for a South Korean who has never lived in France. You think I sound French? Ooh, people always say that. Um, she laughs. Today is she's dressed in red sweatpants, a hoodie by Bianca Shand. 
London. Big up, big up, big up. Ask her to describe her own style, however, and she demurs. I don't describe it because I don't want to define it. Oh, she's so hipstery. Cringe, but I love it. Because I could never do this sort of stuff. I could never talk about myself in this sort of way with a straight face. But, you know, nowadays, you kind of have to have a bit of... You kind of have to do a bit of this, right? You kind of have to be a bit... um. A bit cringy, a little bit corny, a little bit self-absorbed, but a little bit aloof, right? You kind of have to be like that, right? So I think for anyone reading these interviews and, oh man, real DJs don't do that, don't give interviews, and blah, 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 blah. like relax, right? This is the world you live in. You wanna be, you wanna be big shot. You wanna, you know, secure the future of your family. Like she's gonna interview the fucking Evening Standard, for instance. She's a fucking DJ. She's gonna interview an Evening Standard. Like doesn't, yeah, I mean, this is where you wanna be. This is the level you want to operate if you want to kind of, you know pierce through the, the zeitgeist, pierce through the mainstream. If you don't want to do that, fair enough, but you still have to employ a little bit of this sort of like cringiness in your um, rhetoric when you're speaking. It's part of the deal, right? So there she is, dressed all nice and shit. And then what, what's that clothes she's wearing? She's wearing a Burberry t-shirt by Ricardo T-shirt, I'm assuming. And of course, of course they don't let her wear these one, these one look things. I think those, those earrings are that brand, right? I forgot the brand. What is it called? perfect something statement there so, so, so that cufflinks that go in, in in the lobe of your ear um anyway um that's what she's wearing and they don't let you wear anything else so that's what she's got on that of course it reminds me a little bit of what that martin Marger t-shirt that he did back in the day right but anyway um she first going to djing 10 years ago right so this is a 10 year journey which kind of specs out a lot to what let's say did she pop a bit she popped maybe for me in general i can she came in my radar 2017 i think so i think this kind of goes into it does really relate to the whole um, uh, comedy circuit too, right? In, I think in the comedy world, they always say it takes 10 years before you get good. And I think in the DJing world, it maybe takes 10 years before you start earning like, you know, the big, big hundred thousand bucks um, a session sort of way. I think so. I think it takes about 10 years because um, let's look. Actually, let's quickly scan back, right? Because there's this article I read here. This is from um, Mixmag and it's called What DJs Really Earn. I read a while back and I'm always kind of using it as a sort of like a gauge to kind of see where I'm kind of at. Yeah, just as a kind of a goal to kind of aim at, right? Because in general, I would also, even though it's a hobby for me, I would also like to eventually get to a point where I'm essentially playing all these places that I love, know and love, and it's a hobby on the side and I'll do other things, but it's also allowed me to kind of, you know, um, live and be able to pay my rent. So with this got like a little tier of how much DJs get paid, like in general, right? In terms of where you currently are. And I would say I'm definitely on this first tier, right? And the first tier is this one. No, where is it? No, where is it? Read the article from the beginning. There we go. There's a the first tier is this one. Fledgling local resident, right? Tier number one. And it says the following. It says, um, you've made it out of the bedroom and into the club, promoting and playing a regular night at the back of a wine bar or in your hometown. You're pl you're pulling in the punters, but not getting much more attention than that. The gigs, often playing for free to get exposure. So I'm doing that in a couple of weeks for a warehouse party, but most of the time I'm playing for money. Uh, maybe making 100 quid a night, exactly what I get paid. Sometimes 150, sometimes 200. No, sometimes 150, there's the highest. Um, and playing once or twice a, a weekend if you're lucky. Um, and it says here, yeah, 100, uh, 100 pound times 50 a sets a year is five grand, which I didn't really think about that shit. How many sets I do I play a year? Fucking hell um probably still buying your own drinks no we get drinks tokens or we get given drinks although transportation costs are negligible yep i usually get a pay for my own uber and whatever um management doesn't really exist so net after tax before tax sorry i even include all the expenses is about two two thousand five hundred pound a year right that you're getting paid so that's essentially the kind of level i would say i'm at um in comparison but i don't even know why i brought this up but yeah um so i'm about what i'm about five years in six years in DJing on my own, right? Five years in, let's say, estimate. Well, I say four. I don't know if I'd go by my RA list. But anyway, that's kind of what she's saying. 10 years is sort of like the average time it takes to kind of make it. Anyway, it continues. DJ became a serious pursuit in 2012 while she was living in London and studying fashion design in London College of Fashion. Now, this is where I, this is where the kind of, I'd assume the hate would start from, right? So she started to serious pursuit in 2012 while she was studying at the London College of Fashion, right? The LFC. I was supposed to go to college, but didn't. Because I just wasn't interested anymore, she says. Matter of factly, in lieu of attending classes, she practiced DJing, spent time at record stores and in studios, taking time to learn everything she could about music, i.e. skiving from school and DJing a lot and going out. I failed the course. My parents didn't let me come back to South Korea, right? So essentially her parents sent her to the UK, to London specifically, on their dime for her to kind of graduate from college. And she didn't do that because they paid for it. 
So I had to spend 11 months just um, Asian parents, you know, just doing her thing, 11 months, just, you know, hustling, working, whatever she was maybe doing. Eventually, she went back to the to, to the course. I passed it in the end. She failed and then got back on it and passed it and didn't have a reason to stay in London anymore. So I went to Berlin. Again, there's no mention of work, no mention of anything. So essentially, her parents paid for her to come to the UK, fail the course. She got back on it, succeeded, went to Berlin, and they paid for that too. Her goal, and again, and I don't, I don't imagine she was doing much in Berlin either, right? Um, which isn't a bad thing, but I wouldn't be doing much either. Her goal was to be the first South Korean DJ um, to Ber to DJ at the Notorious Elite's Bergheim Club, which she did in 2016, right? So she did that, what, three, four, five, six four years after DJ, four years after taking DJing seriously. He's like, oh, Jesus Christ. In the beginning, I didn't have money. I was a student, so they had to pay for it. So, you know, she was just, she was getting whatever allowance she was meant to be getting, nothing else. They were like, now you want to do fashion. Now you want to do music. What do you want to do next, right? Which, you know, must be annoying for parents that have money and their kids a bit wayward. I was like, if I fail, I'll come back. Just invest in me. One more year, I got this. And essentially, she did do it. In fact, they supported her for almost two years. In the beginning, they were like, "What this DJ? What's this DJ? What have? Why do you have to go out at two a.m. and then come back at five with cigarette smell?" But we're best friends now. Only the most narrow-minded mum could fail to be impressed at her daughter becoming South Korea's most prominent female DJ. Uh, so I kind of get where the hate comes from in, th in this way. Right? Looking at looking at it from that level, I think there isn't. You can't really. Um, you you can get it why people don't like her, right? Um, and I kind of uh, rip because again I didn't know this previously. So essentially, what we found out for his interview is that her family is her parents are very affluent, right? They're extremely rich. They're wealthy enough to be able to afford to send their you know um, young daughter to London, which is not one of the most cheapest cities in the, in, in Europe. Um, it's the complete opposite of that. Uh, to study a course in LFC that also happens to have one of the highest um, tuition rates um, in the entire UK, right? They ha they operate right at the top threshold. I think it might be eight grand or maybe more. I'm not sure how much it is for international students. She, yeah, she'll be international, wouldn't she? She might be even ten grand. So it's no, it's a big, it's a it's a big amount of money you pay, and I'm pretty sure you don't pay in installments. I'm pretty sure you have to pay uh, flat out straight away. So her parents are very rich. They afforded the opportunity to come to the UK to study a course in one of the most prominent universities in London. And essentially allowed her, to, gave her the kind of license to kind of fuck around and stumble around and figure stuff out. And in between that time, she got given another extension then to go to Berlin and go and figure out life there. Where, you know, for the most part, Berlin is like full on debauchery the first time you moved there, especially the first couple of years. And then it kind of levels out into being, you know, your kind of home. So she kind of like, you know, was she, her parents basically allowed her to do what she wanted to do. So I kind of get where the hate comes from in that regard. And I think I wrote something down there, right? The the um and I guess for most people that begin DJing, I think it, comedy being the same thing, you kind of do it just through I don't think it's you don't even do it in the idea of like wanting to become rich and famous, right? And you always do it in kind of um you always do it as a supplement. It's always kind of a, a thing you do on the side, right? Is there something that you're purposely pursuing to kind of, oh, one day I'm going to break through and become Sven Var? There are some people out there that do that for some regard, but most of the time it's because of a love of music, right? A love of club culture. You go to a nightclub for the first time and you're smoky and there's smoke everywhere and people dancing and people's tops are off and people hooking up in corners and the lights are going and this music you've never heard before and there's this dude or girl in the corner spinning the tracks. You're like, fuck, I want to be that person, right? There's other things that happen. Sometimes you go into a club and you're like, shit, I want to be the bouncer. I want to be the door guy dog girl i want to work behind the bar things trigger you right so you essentially come out of it through you come you come you come to djing because of the love of music so to somehow get somebody in the djing circle who's kind of young in 28 very young really in her dj career who has essentially uh been able to make it and progress up the ranks just you know in a very professional manner because it sounds like she was very headstrong and clear about what she wanted to do she wanted to make it as a DJ, right? She wasn't interested about doing this fashion course, wasn't interested about doing anything else. She wanted to make it as a DJ. So she was able to do it because she had all the she had all the free time in the world, right? Her parents were able to kind of, you know, sustain her lifestyle. And I think for other people out there who hate her, I guess it must be a hard pill to swallow because we're all doing this stuff like me, for instance. I'm recording a podcast now. I'm going to upload it. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to come back and then I'm going to go DJ, right? I don't have the time between now and my DJ set to just sit at home and, you know, prepare my playlist. I have to do this stuff. I have to do this stuff, you know, bit by bit. Two hours here on Monday, three hours on Tuesday, two hours on Wednesday. I have to do it in between kind of my regular day-to-day -day life. 
So I guess for some people out there who hate her, it must be like, fuck, I had to do so many things. I had to sacrifice so many things. I had to work around the clock in order to kind of pursue my dreams. And here you are, little rich Asian girl, being given the opportunity to kind of just do what you want to do because your parents are super rich. And now I have to kind of sit here and um, swallow the fact that you're on every single publication, um, every single move you do. If you fart, every company is kind of covering you. I get it. I understand, right? I get that hate. But on the other side, I would say... I also kind of appreciate Peggy Goo because I think a lot, it's hard to have sympathy for rich kids. It's hard. I get it for some people, but you have to really put yourself in their shoes and think to yourself, like, it's very hard. It's, it's very hard if you're a rich kid to be motivated to do anything. Like, let's be for real, right? Because some of us, we know how some of us are when we get a tax rebate, right? When we get a tax refund or when you get incorrectly paid a certain way or when you get a raise or whatever. You want. We know how reckless we can be, right? When we get paid money and we're like extra money and we're like oh my god i've got a surplus of cash and you just start spending loads of shit you don't really care and you're just taking life as it goes right now imagine living in the world living living a life where you know from the moment you were young for the moment that you become older you haven't let, wanted for nothing your house has never been short or anything right your electricity has never gone out there's always been a fully stocked fridge um you've gone on family holidays i've never went on one because you know i grew up fucking dirt poor um what if you wanted a phone it got you know you smashed your phone you, you bought a new one the next day that kind of lifestyle doesn't necessarily um, equip you for being a hustler. Doesn't equip you, equip you for being an entrepreneur. And essentially, Peggy Goo has kind of defied all those stereotypes of rich kid because she's essentially gone into a world of DJing where, yes, in the in the beginning, she probably could have got quite far based on her looks, based on her money, based on her connections, based on her background. I'm pretty sure, but there's a, there's a limit to that, right? You have to be also good at what you do, right? It's essentially like the comedy thing, right? If you're a YouTube influencer or a YouTube person and you've got a big following on YouTube and you decide to suddenly start doing stand-up, there are, there, there, there's a limit to how far you could get, right? You can draw people into the club. You can probably sell out arenas. But once you hit the stage, after those five, that first five minutes, I think someone mentioned it, right? I think someone mentioned it. I forgot what podcast was, but someone mentioned that famous people that do comedy have five minutes of good grace. After that, you better come with the jokes, right? So the public give you five minutes. Oh, wow, there's Rob De Niro. Ha, 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 ha. Then you have to come with the jokes. And if you haven't got no jokes, you're going to get booed out of the arena. So the same thing happens with DJs, right? You get five minutes. You get maybe, I don't know, less than that. You get a, re you get a little threshold until the time you have to realize, okay, does she make good tracks? Is she a good DJ? And from everything I've seen online, I don't think there's anyone out there that can really say with a straight face that she's not a good DJ and that she doesn't make good songs, right? You can't say that. That I think, uh, I, I think a track, whatever, I play it. I play it. I don't know nearly every other week that i dj like there's no there's no time that i don't play it and it always brings a smile to my face dun, 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 dun. like it's fucking amazing track don't ever tell me it's not right so i get it it's annoying she's a rich girl she'd be given all the fucking benefits all the uh, privileges and advantages in the world and it's propelled the position that she's got to now but when she got the opportunity to show improve she showed improved She's a really good DJ and a really good producer. And by and large, she doesn't really bother anyone. But again, I understand it's very hard to have sympathy for rich kids because essentially they're given all the toys in the toolbox, in a toy box, and they get given, you know, carte blanche, nothing. I, I understand, but let's be honest. Like most rich kids that we know of or that we've heard of, let's look at Donald Trump being a really good example of it. They turn out to be fucking dickheads, right? It's just a nature of the game. It's not something you can't even blame them for it in some regard. It's the kind of like, you know, it's the nature of where you're growing up and how you grew up right i'm pretty sure that olivia jade girl that got get mixed up in the laurie mcclellan thing of the, the woman from full house you know i'm pretty sure you know she probably isn't not the nicest girl in the world even if she is i take it back but you know do you blame her for that right her, her, her mum is you know over here um getting coaches to photoshop her head on certain people or fob her results and shit you're gonna be a bit of a dickhead right because you're you know you grew up in a bit of an entitled privileged person that got given everything they wanted i can get it but i guess in peggy Gustav's uh, criteria she's kind of you know circumvented that and done away with those stereotypes so let's give her a bit of a shot anyway let's get back to the interview but again, I understand why people hate her in that regard, reading this. Because again, I didn't know she was a rich kid. I didn't really get the hate. Um, I got, I didn't get the hate in that regard. But now reading it, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, why people do get a lot, don't like her in that regard. Because it's not really her. People don't really like rich kids in general, right? They, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like that famous uh, Donald Trump line. I've got, I got given a small loan of one million. It was like, oh, a small loan. That's not small. But it, it is still small in his regard. Do you know what I mean? And if you can get one million dollars and flip it to a hundred mil, that's a, that's still, that's, that's very good. That's as good as the person that had one dollar in their pocket and started fucking shell motor company right it's still the same sort of thing um anyway um 
To be fair to Mrs. Mrs. and Mrs. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Goo, their daughter's career choice must have been a shock. Neither has any musical background, although Mrs. Goo is a very good singer and plays guitar and piano. My dad loves singing and guitars. Goo herself was trained as a classical pianist like every Asian kid and did dance, taekwondo, maths and swimming. She's pragmatic about the style of parenting. My mum was not a person who always gave me a compliment. If I got an A, she was like, why didn't you get an A plus? Yeah, that's standard Asian African parents. But inside, she's happy. I appreciate people make jokes about Asian parents wanting you to be a doctor impression but my mom never stopped me always supported me now she's like i planned for you to be a dj i knew it well you know that is start part of the part of the plan you know but i guess when she was f faffing around in london and moving to fucking berlin and doing god knows what i'm pretty sure her parents weren't like oh i knew you'll be a success but you know that's the beauty of having um immigrant parents um Gu was headstrong from the get-go, so much so that she moved to London age 14, a black with her parents' blessing. Yeah, alone, she says, I did my GCC levels in Croydon. It's because I wasn't doing well in Korea. Her parents told, paid for her to live with a guardian. Some of my, some of my dad knew, although she changed guardians three times, each one being unable to deal with her for more than a year. Um, what was she doing that made her so hard to handle? When looking at stuff to someone's kid, you have a lot of responsibility. So they were looking locking me in the house. One time I came home ten minutes late. They were freaking out. If I if they'd given me a lot of freedom, I'd have, I'd been a good kid, but they didn't let me do anything. Goo was Goo has been open about her mental health, revealing that she has suffered from depression, and anxiety, particularly while on the road. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, spending those long period. I think there was a Nina Kravitz documentary or one of the others. Spending that time alone on the road can be a bit fucked up with your head. Um, her candor endeared her to fans, many of whom are, yeah, are young Asian women who aren't exactly overwhelmed with strong female role models from their own cultures. What advice would she give to those suffering from mental health issues? First of all, you're not alone. I'm a person who needs to find a solution. So if you have a problem, you solve it. You don't ignore it. You need to listen to you. Talk to a friend. Talk to a doctor. Try medication, yoga. Everyone's different. Cool. Um, I guess, again, like I said, um, touring as much as she does, 200 sh uh, shows a year. With all the stuff on social media, with her peers kind of hating her, with maybe industry stuff that she's heard of in the road, I get it, right? And obviously, didn't she used to go with Jack Master too? That was that period, right? I'm pretty sure she went out with Jack Master, so that might have, you know, added to the added to the confusion. So loads of mess. What helps is her traveling with other people and keeps positive influences around her. I'm also trying to meditate. When when, when I was touring, when I was touring 200 shows i didn't have a life this year i still have a lot of gigs planned but it's important to have one weekend off so i can focus on something else and i really agree agree with that on my level fucking basement um pub level i play mostly every week and i even sometimes get a bit exhausted right playing every friday and then playing every other saturday so sometimes i don't even have a weekend off like i've never i don't think i've had a weekend off in a while like an actual weekend off friday to sunday um it's always been some sort of djing thing and, and again i'm not touring the world i'm just playing around the corner from where i live so i can imagine what it must be traveling what it must be going to new places meeting new people shaking hands again and uh, it just it can be a lot it can be really really exhausting especially if you're spending most of that time on your own um this is her wearing a, a, an amazing i think that's marnie right yeah, it is Marnie. Awesome outfit there. Love that. Um, it's hard to imagine her having time for anything else, yet she managed to launch a fashion collection at Paris Fashion Week last October. Uh, Karen, which means uh, giraffe in um, Korean, Goo's obsessed with giraffe, saying her spirit animal came into being after her friend Virgil Abloh. Again, connections. Artist director Louis Vuitton Menswear introduced her to the NGG, New Guards Group, right? Her former fashion direction, uh, her, his former fashion production house. He doesn't really, he doesn't use it anymore. New Guards Group. He immediately offered to produce Karen, um, the range of two-piece shirts, tops based heavily on her own look, one which her fans frequently adopt at her gigs. She also creates legions of giraffes in her honor um, in the form of soft toys, big and small posters. Every time I go somewhere, there's a giraffe. Last year, I donated them to orphanages. I'm actually thinking of doing an exhibition of them because it's really an effort that fans go to. And I don't take it lightly. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. So every gig, people are giving her giraffes and shit. What's she wearing here? Christopher Kane t-shirt, Nike shoes. Yeah, these shoes, these shoes, it's always Christopher. It's always head to toe looks, isn't it? They never let you anywhere or anything else. So annoying. Um, much has been made of the fact that Good says for a female DJ in industry, still dominated by men. Female DJs also typically earn only half of what their male counterparts do. But Goo is reluctant to talk about her own experiences of sexism, which is very wise because nothing you can say that's going to appease those people. The best revenge is me doing well, she says. She reasons, killing them with kindness. I don't need to talk about it because I've already proved those guys wrong. In any case, she thinks the future is bright female DJs. I don't even like being called 
them like calling a female DJs. There are less of us than men, that's for sure. But there are some killer women DJs out there. A lot of male DJs even say they want to play with the same ratio as men to women, which I agree with. I said it myself, right? I go to nightclubs a lot. I'm always out clubbing. I will definitely class myself as a club kid first, DJ second. And I get annoyed sometimes going to nights and it's just the same old fucking fuddy duddy faces playing the same old rooms, right? And you look around the dance floor and the dance floor is a lot more diverse, a lot more eclectic, a lot more... Uh, of a range of different people than the DJ booth and it's super super annoying right because you don't have to do that much and again like I said how many Afro uh, inspired events have I been to where there's been no black DJ and again I'm not that kind of person to be like you know um um I'm not that person to call out cultural preparation or to kind of you know put my fist up in the air uh, whatever I say black power but how many afro-caribbean that's i've been to is no black dj this is fucking insane that happens right and it happens again and again and again and again it just takes some common sense djing to kind of get that involved but also i think the thing with peggy good that's fucking interesting that's really bizarre in this case is that even though it says here that um some dominated by men female djs um also only gets paid half of what her male camp counterparts do she's not one of them she gets paid probably more than a lot of male DJs, Peggy Goo, right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that she's female. A lot of it also has to do with the fact that she's a good DJ, a great DJ, a great producer, don't get me wrong. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that she is a bit of a token in the industry. She is the female um, Asian, Korea, no, sorry, female um, DJ that happens to be from Korea that also grew up in London, Berlin. I mean, she's got the amalgamation of some of the best fucking places to be as a musician or somebody with a musical taste. She's got all those kind of inside one uh, combination, and she's also fucking awesome on social media. That helps. So she can't really talk about male privilege because essentially she's been given a female privilege. She's got some sort of privilege allowed her to come on that kind of level. Again, I'm a big believer in. I'm a fan of her. I've seen her play a few times. And she's what she's been able to do is that even though she's got this privilege, she's able to be able to back up with talent. A lot of people don't do that, right? A lot of people talk a big game, but aren't necessarily good DJs, right? Like that Mama Shake interview recently on Resident Advisor, which I think is probably the reason why they took off the comments. Mama Shake has a Resident Advisor mix series. She's, you know, it's a regular sort of interview they kind of run through you with and they talk to you about your setup, about where you recorded the mix, what you're going to do in the future. So really black and white basic interview for the most part and then somehow in the interview she somehow gets into social justice worry stuff and starts talking about privilege all this sort of stuff you're like hold on you're studying a phd right you live in one of the most affluent countries in the world like what the fuck are you talking about essentially you got this essentially part of the reason why you're getting the gigs that you're getting is because you talk so much smack on social media about um social justice issues it's like come on let's just really rein it in a bit and let's just understand what we're all doing here and understand what opportunities is given us, right? I think Peggy understands that she's kind of been given the opportunity to be given, partly because of how she presents herself and how good she is on camera and you know how amazing she happens to be as a DJ too. It helps. But let's understand that privilege and let's use it to our advantage. And then hope that these fucking dickhead promoters can use some common sense and then start booking more DJs, more female DJs that are kind of, uh, that you know, that cover a, a lot more bases that aren't maybe as, you know, um, they're, what do you call it? They don't fit in that box because at the t moment, you know, there's this, uh, there's this influx of model worthy female DJs who have kind of popped up out of nowhere, who have kind of blowing up everywhere, and it kind of is a bit off putting, I think, for me personally as a guy. And I must, so, and I must think it must be the same for women, right? I get it. They need to kind of rejig the balances, but then don't just go out and just start booking all the hot DJs. Let's just get more female DJs involved anyway that cover all the bases, right? And just kind of have a bit more common sense booking. So in that way, Peggy Goo won't get as much stick because there's oh, loads of other girls getting booked. But the fact that she's the only one that's really being booked at the highest level, like her, Amelia Lenz, Nina, Nina Kravitz, and maybe a couple of others, um, Helena Hoof maybe, they are then, because they're the only ones, they are then having, they're, they're essentially... Um, copying the same it's the same sort of thing happening in the male dj place right it's the same thing that they're talking about is kind of being replicated in the female dj space right the top five percent are earning 10 times what anyone else is earning and that's where the kind of hate comes from i think in my experience so i think the more female DJs they get involved the less hate that she would get overall potentially anyway i'm not sure if it's going to happen but potentially um there's a scant detail about good personal life online so i'm surprised when she starts talking about her boyfriend the photographer and director uh, jonas lindstrom which means official now that we know she probably split up with jack master um would, did it come because of the back of that kind of instant jack master had we don't know i don't care not my business 
Um, we've been together since February, she says, with a enthusiasm of a first flush of love. He's very talented. He did the Hermes campaign in YSL and a big Calvin Klein campaign and a Kendrick Lamar music video. They met on a shoot before I'd been meeting a lot of insecure guys. They had to keep proving that they were a man, you know. What? <laughs> But with him, he's relaxed, he's confident, he's good at what he does, he loves his job, he works hard, so we motivate each other. I need that, he's amazing. He had to have, to, he had to be to keep up with Peggy Goo. This writer fucking is in love with Peggy Goo, isn't it? Who, who read this? Um, what's the person's name? Give them a shout out, because they were on Peggy Goo's nuts. Laura Craig. So yeah, um, check out this article, it's a really good one. I think everyone's going to be talking about it in DJ Circles. Again, I get how people hate her because essentially she's super successful and she's come from a very privileged, wealthy background. But I think, you know, the left, again, I think if she was white, ooh, 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 if she was white and had blonde hair and blue eyes and she was from Notting Hill, she would be getting pelters, like pelters. And she hanged around with, um, what's her face? Who's that girl? Um, a fucking dull eye that everyone fucking talks about. Um, the one that's always on Vogue. Um, what's her fucking name? The It Girl. I don't know. She hanged out with those fashion It Girls from London, right? She would be getting pelters. But I think it's she's in such a weird place where she's kind of been getting inoculized from the hate because, you know, she's Asian, um, you know, uh, because she comes literally comes from Korea. She's not like an, you know, uh, she, she well, didn't grow from here. She moved to London in 14. Her parents are very well. I think it kind of inoculized her from a lot of the hate. But if she was blonde, would she was blonde with blue eyes, oh. They would be hating on her so hard. And again, I just I, I just wish there was more conversation being had about just how difficult it must be to be very talented and very good looking, also very wealthy. There is something that people don't talk about too often. Because I think, you know, the general Rex Richard story is that, oh, I came to this place with just a bag on my back with only a dollar in my pocket, you know. That's the kind of Rex Richard story people like to hear, but people don't really like want to hear the story of like, yeah, my mum was, I don't know, an MP. My dad is a, a very successful lawyer. And here I am, the owner of this record label. People don't really like that. It's just like, oh, yeah, of course you're a record label. Your mum had all the money. You know what I mean? But it's still hard to start a business up. It's still hard to employ people, to make a business successful, to sign the right artists. It's a difficult thing to do. It's not, it's not easy. Plus, like I said, you always have the safety net of your parents having all the money in the world, right? So you don't necessarily need to do anything. There's no motivation. Your parents give you a fucking allowance, right? You have a... What's that thing? Is it hedge fund? What's that thing called? Um, I don't know. That thing where the parents leave you money. Like, you have an inheritance, right? Like, there is something needs to be said by it. People don't really talk about too often. But again, I just think... I, I think... I really commend Peggy because I think, in general, she got a foot in the door because of what she looks like, because of how she dressed, and because of where she's from. And, you know, and she got given the advantage of being able to practice all those years because her parents allowed her to have a lifestyle. She didn't need to get, like, a regular job. She might be able to work in bars here or there, but for the most part, she could concentrate on her DJing. And it's paid dividends, right? And there's an added added thing that people don't want to talk about here, too. Maybe she's just really talented. Maybe that's one of the things you just have to you have to suck up. Maybe she's just more talented than you. All these things said, maybe she's just really talented. She's got a background in music. She's been learning piano since she's, well, I don't know, one if you're an asian family that might help being a dj that might help being a good producer that could help really her parents sing right even though they said it's a weird sentence said something along the lines she's not got any musical background in her family but her parents sing like i don't know man maybe she's just de destined to be this way right and again i'm interested to see how it, her story develops but yeah this is a very good interview dj peggy goo on the best way to deal with sexism kill them with kindness out now on the standard i'll link you below the show notes